On today's show, I pay an emotional visit to the brave servicemen and women who've been wounded in Iraq. I wouldn't be anywhere else other than here right now. This has truly been a blessing for me. Then, the incredible story of two missionaries in the Philippines who were captured and held for over a year. The story is about forgiveness, hope, and healing. Is it possible? I've learned that forgiveness is absolutely essential. If you don't forgive, you're going to carry a huge burden. And last season's American Idol finalist, Anwar Robinson, is here, right here in the studio with an inspiring song. Since then, I have found Christ. There is me. So grab yourself another cup of coffee, come along for the ride. I'm Naomi Judd, and it's a brand new morning. Every day's a new day. Every day's a new way. Somebody like you There's a power you can pass along To heal our heart and make it strong There's hope with every dawn Every day's a new day Hiya! Good morning! You know sometimes life just looks so stinking bad that you think Man, I'm just not going to make it through it this time. Been there myself, but I have to say that there's nobody has it easy, right? Y'all been there too? Yep. And you just think, uh-oh, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this particular one. But we don't stay there long because we can't. We can't. Life is always moving forward. Well, today's stories uh, are what we're going to explore. We're going to figure out through some regular folks who've had extraordinary things happen to them, how they went to hell but came back. They found out, and I think this is a line in a Winona Judd song. Sometimes a dead end is just a good place to turn around. <laughs> Some of our military servicemen and women know that all too well. And recently I had the great honor of visiting their families and them at the fabulous Walter Reed Medical uh, Center in Washington, D.C. And I particularly bonded with a, a Lieutenant Gloria Bonds very dedicated RN. You guys got to check her out. Nurse Naomi Judd reporting for duty. I used to work in hospitals. In fact, the minute I walk into a hospital, I'd automatically feel, I'm home. I've asked myself the question, are nurses born? Is there something in that double helix in our DNA that predisposes us to becoming uh, nurses? And I think they're a very special breed. There is an illumination of that Lieutenant Colonel Bond. She has this radiant inner core about her. Trust her with my life. I wouldn't be anywhere else other than here right now. This has truly been a blessing for me. Truly has. I mean, to see the soldiers come back and they're just so, so willing to go back out and do what they can for their country and to be with their fellow servicemen and women and they just want to be there. This is Specialist Castillo, Eric Castillo. Hi. Hi, Specialist Eric. What were you thinking of when you were injured? Actually, when I when I got injured and this injury, I really didn't see it coming. I didn't feel mm -hmm. anything. It, it just took me by surprise. The young man with the brain injury uh, will be permanently tattooed on my mind because uh, of his bond with his mother. Last year, it was um, I almost had a. a a breakdown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very difficult. But we need to be strong for them. Oh, yeah. And one of the big things, and I had to learn this hard way myself, is you got to take care of yourself so that you can be there for them. Correct. I think a lot of our patients, because of the magnitude of their injuries, that their families do have a stronger belief. They're believing that their loved one is going to pull through. And so they do cling to, I, I found that a lot of them do cling to a higher power. They do. They, they look to that, to, to heal their loved one, to, to see them through. So where'd you get all this faith in yourself? Because that's really what it comes down to. Well, I have a, a background. Both of my grandfathers are Baptist ministers. Ah, so. I knew it. <laughs> Had to be something because you just so. exude self-esteem. Being in this environment where these men and women are just coming back from Iraq. Talk about faith. They have come back injured. So now they have to have faith in um, the talented hands of all the doctors 
and lots and lots and lots of strangers. This is Sergeant Will. <laughs> what is going on? Oh, Are you I'm going home? To. I'm hoping to. As a woman, it's so refreshing to meet a man like Eric Wheeler, who's a caregiver. He's a husband and a, and a father and all that, but he's a medic. There's things that I've seen and done that, that's not clinically normal. Um, war is not normal. Mm -hmm. Daniel and Kim. Uh, Daniel and Kim, and these are recent? Yeah. Wow. It definitely affects the kids. Daddy's hurt now. Daddy can't jump on the trampoline with them anymore. It's uh, For the time being. Not for the time being. I can tell you that I will never forget today. I will never forget the stories. It is our stories that connect us. It's our stories that make you and I human to one another. I spent the whole day there, and I was just completely overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed with the dedication of these people. Today I'm here with my companions on our journey to the other side of despair, Pastor Otis Moss, Rabbi Sherry Hirsch. Welcome, welcome. Um, how in the world? We're just fallible human beings. We have families of our own and our own feelings. What do you do when somebody comes in? It's, it's so incredibly difficult. Many times you just have to be honest with people uh, and let them know that you're there for them and make sure that they have a community around them. And also, in terms of how people view their tragedy, um, there's, a, there's a wonderful blues song. I think it says something to the fact uh, that if you're going through hell, don't stop. If you're catching hell, please don't hold it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes we need to take that kind of perspective that if you're going through a particular period, you've got to realize that it is, it is temporary and that there's a community that can surround you and love and lift you up so that you can look to but, something greater. But sometimes, Otis, when I hear such a story, Naomi, sometimes I just weep in my office right mm -hmm. there with them mm -hmm. because there are no words that would comfort them. And... God is weeping, yeah. so I weep too, and then we go through a lot of Kleenex. That's what goes on in my Absolutely. office, a yeah. lot of Kleenex. Yeah. But that's pure honesty. Mm -hmm. don't do, we don't do um, nicey-nice. No. Right. Sometimes yeah. what you have to do is just bear witness yeah. and, just, and just be right there with them. Well, these extraordinary servicemen and women that you just saw earlier, only the beginning, are only starting the beginning of their long road to recovery. Uh, what happened to them over there uh, in the midst of war was horrific and, and dramatic, but now they have this long, long rehab thing in front of them. Up next, another American war hero, and then later on in the hour, we have a woman who was held captive in the jungle for over a year. She's going to tell us her harrowing story of survival, loss, and of course, hope. about getting to the other side of despair. Like earlier, you saw my visit to Walter Reed Medical Center where I got to meet up with some injured soldiers. Uh, well, my next guest is also trying to rebuild his life. On October the 9th of 2004, over there in Baghdad, a roadside bomb caused him to lose his leg. But even after being in a coma and even suffering a stroke, he somehow <laughs> found the courage to not only survive, but to thrive. Please welcome, and I'm honored to have you with us, Sergeant Ramon Guitard. <laughs> now, you have to smile once in a while. <laughs> I told him off camera, I said, you got to smile, and what would you say? I really don't smile, I'm a soldier. <laughs> He's military. <laughs> well, just for today, just for today. Okay, tell us how you got to Iraq. Your, was, this uh, was your second deployment to Iraq. Second deployment. I, I left... Uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, to go to Fort Bragg. I got to Fort Bragg. My wife was also pregnant at the time. Um, found out as I was moving to my apartment um, that I was um, going to deploy in less than 60 days. Found out I was leaving on um, the 15th of June. The baby she, I was. I bet she wasn't happy. She wasn't too happy. Not too happy. Not, not only the fact you're going to Iraq, but she's, she's due to give birth any due day. Due to give birth. Um, my little girl was born on May 25th. I deployed three weeks later. Yikes. So tell us what happened that awful day in Baghdad. Um, just, just riding around in a convoy. Out of nowhere, big flash, great boom. Um, looked down, my leg just split wide open to the bone. Uh, floorboard gone. Um, someone behind me screamed, her legs, her legs, and um, asked me to call for help. Her radio was demolished, so my radio was still um, working. I took my radio off and called for help. You did? I did. I called for help. And before we came out, 
You said that you wanted to say thank you to the... Yes. The soldiers um, that took me out of the um, vehicle, the uh, young enlisted soldiers, two specialists, they pulled me out. I've never saw them. I saw them the night they pulled me out, but I, I just want to thank them, thank them a lot. Do you know their names? I don't know their names, but they're from Fort Bragg. Um, they were MP unit that were with us. Just want to thank them. Thank you. So tell me why it is. It, it was the most horrific accident. Why do you think you survived? It's just uh, where I've been, how I've been raised up. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York for 13 years, by, uh, raised by a single parent, uh, moved to South Carolina and just came into the military not knowing what I wanted to do. Uh, military um, reared me up and taught me, taught me a lot. Taught you about survival? Survival. I want to hear about the Iraqi man that came over. Um, after I was uh, injured in a roadside bomb, they took us out. They put me on a stretcher, laid me outside. And one of the Iraqi nationals that were in the convoy just knelt beside me and told me his name, asked him my name, and he said, do you mind if I pray for you? I said, I don't mind. Wow. He mm -hmm. continued to pray for me in Arabic. And in the end, I, I heard him say, Allah will be with you. That's all I remember. Allah will be with you. We all know what it means. I knew what it meant. I told him thank you. Do you still see his face and remember that moment of... From time to time, I do. Mm -hmm. So what happened next? Um, got into the helicopter. I was very furious. I was looking for the rest of the soldiers, you know, because I promised from the beginning that I'd protect and take care of them if anything happened, that I would. Got in a helicopter, was yelling at the crew chief, you know, where my buddies are, where my buddies are. He said, calm down. I'm going to take you out and take you to the hospital. So he took me to the hospital, and that's all I remember. Got to the hospital. I, I went out. That's it. So you were, you lost your leg, and you were put in a medically induced coma? Yes for quite a while, and you had a stroke. Yes. So you're partially blind? Um, I had a light stroke. The light stroke was caused by a blood clot to my brain. Right. The blood clot to my brain caused a stroke. I was partially paralyzed on my left side. The vision loss on my right eye is due to a rock that is lodged in the back of my eye and is still currently there. It's my, still there? Yes. My uh, left leg was um, badly damaged. My knee was blown completely out of the vehicle, my left knee. So they fused it to save it because my wife um, said they have to figure out a way to save it. And we have your beautiful wife in the, yes. the audience. You're telling yes. me she spent your money to get her hair done yes. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, yes. what did you feel like when you saw him for the first time in oh. this kind of shape? I was speechless. You know, I didn't know what to expect. He's telling me that you got him through. And then you were telling me earlier that he's the reason that you got through. We both were there for each other. So tell us what you're doing now. Well, currently now I'm out there. Um, I do just about everything everyone else does. Um, I do everything maybe differently, but now I'm doing marathons out there, trying to talk to young well, people. Well, wait, stop just a minute. Did I, what, what word did I hear? Marathons. <laughs> Since uh, October of last year, six months ago, I've completed five full marathons and one half marathon. Is that right? Yes. So you, you got a little hitch in your giddy up, but you're still going? Yes. <laughs> Now, Ramon, I have to say that sometimes people will ask me who my heroes are, and I know they're expecting me to say, you know, some same famous mm -hmm. person. You're my hero. I appreciate you, it. Thank you. You are my hero. Thank you. Wow. A true American hero. <laughs> Up next, we've got a husband and wife, a little R&R, &R, beautiful island, and then whew, unspeakable horror. We've got a bizarre story of survival when we come back next time. Six to see how fast you can get out of debt. We've been talking about getting back up after life just, you know, pounds you down. Well, Gracia Burnham has done just that. She and her husband, Martin, they were missionaries in the Philippines until they were taken captive for more than a year. Here's their unbelievable story. I'm a pastor's daughter, and I had heard all my life, you know, in this life, you will experience tribulation or trouble. I grew up hearing that, but it never happened to me. And I think I maybe thought I was exempt. Martin and I met in college. Martin was a jungle pilot for New Tribes Mission. He had done that for 15 years in the Philippines. We truly loved that country. It's where the kids were born, where they grew up. We left the American dream behind and went overseas to make a difference in the world. For Martin and I, in one swift swoop, everything we had 
was taken away from us except each other. We were not targeted at all. We were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Martin had just been to the States and I knew he would have jet lag. I asked some friends, where's a good place that we could go just for 24 hours so Martin can rest? And they said, oh, Dos Palmas, you'll love it. Our anniversary was the next day. May 28 is our anniversary. It was a wonderful place, you know, had a lovely meal and went to bed and before dawn the next morning there was banging on the door. Three guys with M16s broke the door in. That began a year of running for our lives and watching atrocities and starving. The atrocities, we saw them daily. Life was so, so cheap to them. I would tell myself, this can't get any worse, and then it would get worse. I really miss my kids. Every day we would sit and say, you know, I wonder what the kids are doing right now. There is something to be said for the Stockholm Syndrome. We got to know them and we got to know what their dreams in life were. Their stories of grievances, atrocities that had been committed to them. And we couldn't help but um, grow to really care for them. And I know that sounds weird, but you know, that's what missionaries do. They go overseas because they care about people. And that didn't change in Martin and I once we became hostages. The Army was doing their dead level best to get us out of there. We knew that one day the bullets weren't going to whiz past our heads. They were going to find us. Martin died in our 17th gun battle. It was the Rambo style shoot up and we were immediately shot. And I slid down the hill and came to rest next to Martin. Suddenly I felt this heaviness. Martin, he just got heavy. And I think of that term, the weight of death. When the gun battle was over and I could tell that um, the soldiers were coming down the hill, I started moving my hands around so they would know I was alive. And um, as they drug me up the hill that morning, I looked back at Martin and he was white. And that's when I knew he was dead. We want everyone to know that God was good to us every single day of our captivity. Martin also was a source of strength to all the hostages. He was a good man and he died well. I, I came home happy. I came home so happy that I think I offended some people. But here was the answer and I was so happy to go home to my kids and um, I was so happy that Martin was free and had got, gone home to be with God. Sometimes I wonder why, why the weak one came home. Yeah, I was the weak one and Martin was the strong one. And I often wonder why did the weak one come home? But maybe it's just to show people, maybe it's to show my kids, God uses weak things. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the strongest. You don't have to be self-sufficient. God uses the weak things. I've learned that forgiveness is absolutely essential. If you don't forgive, you're going to carry a huge burden and your world is going to become very small. I got home to the States and we sat down to plan the funeral. And I thought it would be, you know, a few people at Rose Hill Bible Church. The man from the funeral home said we're expecting about 4,000 people. It was an awesome funeral. And it was just the, the connectedness that people felt because they'd been praying and hoping so badly that we would come home. This is just small town America at their best. People say, you know, do you go for counseling? Do you have a support system? I tell them, you know, Rose Hill, Kansas is my support system. The kids seem to be doing well. They seem well adjusted for what they've been through. Jeff is studying to be a, a missionary pilot like his dad. Maybe he'll end up back there. Jeff's going to get married this summer. He has found 
the sweetest girl, Sarah, the day he's getting married is May 27. That's the day Martin and I were taken hostage. We're going to take that date in infamy or however you want to say it and make it into just a really good day. I think people do see my, my story as one of hope. I think people can identify with me because I've been through some struggles and, and I've come out the other end. People can see God's goodness in my life and they hope that God can do that for them. Do you see all the contradictions in this? I mean, first she started saying Stockholm Syndrome, which is where you identify with your oppressors. Right. Right. And she actually, in his hideous circumstances, she understood their story. But I actually thought she was quite consistent. From the beginning, she was a truly compassionate, altruistic person right. till the very end. I, so that's what I'm saying. Then she said that he, I mean, he died on top of her in a gun battle. She used the word Rambo. But it was some horrible action movie, but she said he died a good, a good death. Wow. She was living a life that was bigger than her. And that's one of the beautiful things is when someone knows that they are living a life that is beyond me. And she was living the great virtues, the courage to love, the courage to forgive. Uh, William Sloan Coffin, who recently passed, said one of the greatest virtues is courage. Um, because you can't love unless you have courage. You can't forgive unless you have enough courage. And but she demonstrates the courage to forgive on uh, the courage to love. But that's the novice tombstone. Mm -hmm. and, and she also forgives her captors exactly. to some degree. This is an extraordinary human being. That's I powerful. mean, if that isn't a hero, I don't know what is. And, and it goes against everything we believe. I know, that's what I'm saying. Everything about it. Her son's going to become a pilot over in the Philippines. Right. I know. Man, what a story. She said, the weak survive. She's not, I have a message for you, dear. You're not weak at all. Right. But I think that's an interesting point, though, too, Naomi, is that we think we're weak uh -huh. when we're really quite strong. It's just we haven't been put in the circumstances that show us who we truly and authentically are. And she had a moment, and she was clearly quite strong. And what she vi viscerally, you know, we're thinking that, oh, my goodness, as a result of this, we should have vengeance that should be, you know, coming out of our heart. Uh -huh. But then she contradicts everything exactly. that we're kind of taught, whether it's national policy, whether uh -huh. it's in community, society, that uh, when you live out these virtues, they take hold of you and they possess you. And but you hard. Live. It's very difficult. Otis, I'm looking at her. Difficult. She's an inspiration. I Absolutely. mean, I hope I can be a quarter of that. And Absolutely. the jungles in the Philippines. I'm not complaining when my flight's delayed. I was going to say, <laughs> me neither. Well, up next, <laughs> up next, how the power of family can get you through. This is what you said. The power of family can get you through anything. Today, we've been meeting some ordinary people to whom something extraordinary happens, and then we get to see their bravery and their grace. Wow. That absolutely describes this next family. 13-year-old Gabrielle DeWitt and her brother Cody just came home from school one typical day to find out Mom wasn't home. Where was she? She was in the hospital being diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. And once they all found out, this family decided to take action and create a very personal documentary. I was crushed when I first found out the news. Um, when she went through her chemotherapy, she started to lose her hair, so we had to cut her hair. And it was hard for me knowing, seeing us cut her hair. When we had to shave my mom's head because of the chemo, was, all her hair was falling out, we wanted to shave it all in one big clump so that you know, she didn't get all depressed when her hair just started falling out. Well, my littlest sister had to watch, and if she knew what was going on, I'm sure she'd be crying. It's hard. It's sad to know that even if this cancer does get come over my mom, it's hard to know that we can grow up, up without her. Well, I'm very honored and, and very happy to say that Susan DeWitt is here joining with us with her children, Cody and Gabrielle. 
was interesting watching uh, your reactions to the tape. You guys are just petting each other and soothing each other. Um, very, very touching. Uh, you, you were 39 and you were diagnosed with stage 4 lung yes. cancer. Yes, I was. And uh, they say that something like 75% of all people have a couple of years with that horrible diagnosis. Um, how did you find out? I actually was in the emergency room for chest pains and went to the emergency room to be checked out for the chest pains and had the EKG and the doctor came in and said, I've got good news and bad news. You know, you have, your heart's fine, uh -huh. but we found a tumor in the upper right level of your lung. That's how you found out. You've never That's smoked a cigarette. I did smoke in high school. Back when you were young, though. Back when I was younger, yes. It's been several years since um, I have quit smoking. <laughs> um, Cody, Gabrielle, why did you decide you had to do the documentary? Well, <clears throat> I think that we wanted to do it because it was going to help my mom. I mean, she seemed really into it. She really wanted to you know, change people's lives. And, and at the time, I didn't realize how, you know, how big it was going to get, and I just wanted to do it because it was going to make her happy. What about you? Um, I wanted to do it, too, for, for me to express, like, what we've been going through and to help other families not go through what we've gone through. Did having something proactive, something to actually do, help you communicate within, each, within your family to your mom about how you, all the stages you were going through emotionally? Well, it helped me a lot because I kept, well, I keep all my feelings inside. I don't really express with a lot of people. So it helped me kind of open up and just share our, our story. Tell us about your dad. Um, right after I was diagnosed, I had a new relationship with God. And I was attending church with, with the kids, and um, my husband was agnostic, so he was not attending. And he encouraged us, told us, you know, go ahead and go. I think it's a great thing. And then one day I came home, and I was trying to talk to him about the service, and I was trying to explain things to him, and he just wasn't getting it. So what he told me was, I'll go. I'll go with you. I'll sit next to you. I'll be a warm body, but don't expect anything from me. And I said, okay. So he came, and within two weeks, he, two weeks of attending church, he accepted God into his life, Jesus into his life as his Savior. And within 30 days, he was baptized. We were baptized together as um, Christians, and now we are very active in our church, and it's brought us all together. It's a it's what gets us through our daily lives. It's just our faith and our, our belief that we have a purpose. And what's your outlook for the future? I just hope that we can stop people from smoking and um, teenagers from smoking, because that's when it all starts, is mainly in high school. And how old are you? 13. Phew. Say it, like, say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. I uh, just want to stop people from smoking so that they don't have to go through what we're going through right now. Cody? And it's, it's not just the smoke. It's like the people that you're surrounded by as well. I mean, if you're surrounded by people that smoke, even if you don't do it, the secondhand smoke can affect you the exact same. I mean, you're, you might not be killing yourself, but you're affecting all the people that you love and they are surrounded by you. So... If we just get more people to realize that and realize it's not just them they're hurting, you know, it's their, fam it's their future families, it's their friends, it's their future kids, then you know, maybe they'll think about it more when they pick up a cigarette. I mean, I just, I just look at the three of you all and the fact that you're here and the love you express between each other. I mean, this body language is telling us all so much right now, but who you are as individuals and who you are as a family is an incredibly powerful, positive message. God bless all of you. Thank you so much for being Thank with you. us today. Thank you. Astounding grace. Well, we've just seen what happens when uh, kids take something really terrible and turn it into something better. Next up, we're going to see what happens when good kids make really bad decisions instead. The Day One Diner is going to tackle that issue.
My mother was just diagnosed with breast cancer, I was just telling Otis, and I'm not smiling because of that, because she's, I'm smiling because she's an amazing woman. She got the diagnosis, and the doctor called her, and he said, are you at home? Are you grieving? And she said, no, I'm at the hairstylist getting my hair done. If I'm going to see all these people. I might as well look good doing it. <laughs> and that was, that was my mother, so. That's why we call resilience. Yeah, and courage. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm here with Otis Moss and Sherry Hurst discovering and discussing how in the world we get back up. We go get our hair done or yep. whatever. Well, can we protect our children? That's, for me, that's the hard part. I could go through anything, but how do you protect your children when they're making bad decisions? Stuff that could really hurt them. Otis, you talked about this? I don't know if you can completely protect your children. Well, in the Day One Diner, we discuss it, and there are some different viewpoints. Yeah, definitely. Sherry was there, so you know she. She yeah. always has an interesting Same. viewpoint <laughs> with another person who's there. So um, it's a good discussion about uh, how, how we engage these issues. Here's the scenario. Someone in your congregation comes to you they have a child who they say is making bad decisions. Dating the wrong person, they got a house that's too expensive, they're part of a job that's too dangerous, and they're really worried about their child. How do you counsel them? You always have to consider who are the parents yes. and what's their mm. level of control. I had a situation, a woman came in to me, she's a neurosurgeon, she went to one of the best Ivy Leagues, mm. she's dating a very nice man, but he's not Jewish, but he's going to convert. The parents came in, and told me she makes bad decisions across the board. And to look her straight in the eye with her sitting there, I turned to them and I said, no, you don't trust her. This is a person that makes very good decisions. So you have to consider the parents. Agreed. And at the same time, you know, we would, we would also know that there are children out there, adult children, who make bad mm -hmm. decisions. And parents are in an awkward situation mm -hmm. there. You know, do they, do they go directly to them and say, here's what you're doing wrong? Um, do they wait for them to come and, and solicit their wisdom? Do they make themselves available? And that, that's usually the counsel that I give is that's make good. yourself yeah. available yeah. to your child. But I think you've got to allow adult children to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I think you do advise them, give them your best advice, and be there for them in the middle of it. But I think to try to make the decisions for them or to uh, alienate them if they're making a decision that you happen not sure. to like it's not a way to go yeah. and I think uh, your point Sherry about um, knowing the situation in the parents it's a key one would be a key yeah, and one I think for me. The, the grace to, to have the grace as a parent to watch your child making a bad decision mm -hmm. and yet be there for them at the end of that decision to say I still love you mm -hmm. uh, one quote that I like is unrequested advice creates resentment mm -hmm. And I think if we continue to give our children, especially as adults, unrequested advice, mm. over time we will create distance and resentment, which we really don't want. That's different than being there so that when they open the door at all for advice, then we can really give them what we think. But and, I think you can't protect your child from everything. Right. And some of the greatest I sure. lessons that I have learned is from the mistakes that I've made. Sure. And had my parents not let me make those mistakes, and had those disappointments, I may not be the person I am today. Because if everything is always in a safe shell. You know, Sherry, I would say that's true too, but it's also been by the reaction of my parents to the mistakes I've made oh, and how they have reacted, both right. good and bad, right. at times that's very negatively and at times very so. good. Right, right. exactly. It, you know, I love yeah. you and yeah. I can see that hurt you. And I think being overly critical just really shuts down a person's growth, whether that's a child or sure. someone else you're in relationship with. If everything you bring to the table is always going to be criticized and that's not good enough and I would do it different, what does that do to help validate that person's sense of being and worth? So I think that there is this balance that you have to walk with them. Okay, I love watching the audience when we're doing everything. <laughs> and what was the line about the pastor said? When Billy said, no unrequested, unrequested advice. advice. And that one right there. Okay. She just hit her right mother. There, right, there, right there. Do it again. <laughs> Pop her. Yeah, she <laughs> <laughs> You did not hit her like that. You yeah, like it, was, it was a full-on whop. It was a whop. <laughs> it was exactly what I would do if my mother was sitting there, you know? 
So what is your reaction to all this? Unfortunately, we can't fire our children. Because sometimes I think there's a statute <laughs> get, of limitations. Or get enough, a divorce. Yeah, enough is enough. I mean, sometimes they've got to grow up and you've got to let them go. And, and they still are clinging and holding and holding and still expecting approval. It's a very hard thing. After you've done all you can, uh -huh. <laughs> just stand. Just, just, just like Donnie McClurkin says. And just sometimes you've got to let them fall. Um, and then you'll be there. This is coming from someone who has little kids, and this yeah. is coming from someone right. who also has little kids. Can we get back right. to you in about 16 years on this? Yes. After, we want to talk hey, to that's you. what my parents do for me. <laughs> I fall tell down, you. I'll be there to pick you up, but sometimes you got to fall on your I own. I tell you the two things my therapist, this has cost me a lot of money to figure this out, but he said number one <laughs> is sometimes the best thing you can do is just set a good example. Mm -hmm. I mean just, and I, I say I try to be like the fireman, I only come when I'm called. And for somebody who's as overprotective as I am, this has been a real challenge in my life. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the best thing you can do is silence, because silence speaks louder than anything. And sometimes as parents, we're just flat out wrong. Audience participation. If you have a question that you think our day one diner should talk about, we want to know. Maybe you want some advice even so you can get a name. Maybe you need advice. I don't get to give it to my kids. Maybe I can help you. <laughs> Go to our website. It's at faithstreams.com. Just click on feedback. Love to hear from you. And up next, well, I know it's one of the most popular American Idol finalists from all time. Everybody get ready for the sweet sounds of Anwar Robinson right here. Right here. Today's show demonstrates the resilience of the human spirit. Now, woohoo, it's time to celebrate musically. So I'm here with American Idol finalist from New Jersey, Anwar Robinson. <laughs> this is so fun. I watch you on TV. Now, I'm with you on TV. <laughs> it's amazing to me. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? And you were a music teacher, what, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade? Yeah, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade vocal. And I went to a music school in Princeton, New Jersey, Westminster Choir College, and got my bachelor's degree. And I was very blessed and fortunate to be around, you know, music people and teachers all my life. So that's basically why I'm doing what I'm doing now. And I can't imagine what, what you've done for these kids. Not only, I mean, aside from the classroom, I'm sure that they were all watching you on the show going, if he can do it. So can I. Yes. OK, so you're writing now. I did some writing for my original album, which will be out probably, if not the end of this year, early next year. But I decided to do um, cover songs for this album, songs that I was inspired by, so that people can understand, you know, me paying homage to people who wrote and sang, you know, wonderful music, you know, for the, over the last, you know, basically 40 year span. That's basically, I like to reach back and get some of those good old songs that, you know, were written even before I was born because I believe that's a lot of the best music is in, you know, the heart of that Speaking time period. Speaking of best music, I want you to go over there right now because uh -huh. you brought the sunshine. Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. On what Robinson is singing. You brought the sunshine. Too hard for my God to work out. 
problem. No matter what the problem, I can always solve. Yeah, I can always solve them, y'all. Come on, drop him today. He will brighten up your day, and he'll come your way, and he'll be when you cry. And, of course, to my sidekicks here, Otis and Sherry, uh, all of our guests on today's shows were just so so optimistic yeah. and hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I think we really traveled around the world and uh, back a, a couple of times. Bring us home with just this. Just ordinary people doing extraordinary things, serving an extraordinary God. Hmm. Top that. I, I was going to say, I can't top that. That was so beautiful. It Give was us really, a nugget. I just think it's, it's really miraculous because it gives, hopefully gives each one of us courage. You know what? I felt like uh, these people's lives just just exploded into chaos, mm -hmm. but they chose, operative word, chose right. to mm -hmm. expand instead of contract, mm -hmm. and it's like they, they almost knew somehow intuitively that it's really about um, what is this situation trying to teach me? Mm -hmm. what, what good right. thing can I make out of this horrible situation? And that's one concept that's kept me from falling apart, is just remember that everything does happen so we can become who we're meant to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I sure hope you're going to come back and see us. We're here every Sunday on Naomi's New Morning. And remember, <sighs> my mind is always open and my door is never closed.